Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a hyper-connected world, <laughs> but also welcome to a very uncertain world. What Minush and I are going to try to do this morning is to give you the global context. So Minush, let me start with the economy. As you know, the OECD last week downgraded quite significantly the world economic outlook uh, to 2.9% this year, 3% next year. And for a while, we weren't sure about the impact of the trade war, but this downgrade was directly related to the impact of the, of the trade war. So my first question to you is, how worried should we be? Hmm. I, it, is, it is now clear that the trade war is behind the slowdown. And I think, uh, I think we should be worried. I think we should be worried uh, because you know, I would start by saying trade actually had started to slow down before the trade war started. We had a massive increase in global trade as China was being integrated into the global economy. So for many decades, the growth of trade was faster than the growth rate of GDP. That changed uh, a few years ago before the trade war started because China had been absorbed into global supply chains and had been integrated in the world economy. So there already had been a bit of a slowdown. But the more recent slowdown is really driven by the fear of the rise of protectionism. And that, the reason I think we need to be worried is not just because of the direct impacts of growing protectionism, but because it's symptomatic of a, a view about the global economy and the adherence to a rules-based international system which has delivered so much prosperity in recent decades. I'd like to get to what monetary policy and fiscal policy can do about this. But before that, um, just talking about the trade war, it seems to me that even if we get a trade deal between the US and China and the talks have, have now, uh, they seem to be back on track. Mm. The Washington consensus now is one of confrontation mm. with China. And this goes way beyond the administration. Yes. And I think the hardening of attitude is, goes even beyond the US. How do we get to a situation where we create rules of engagement with, with China and avoid a Cold War? Yes, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, for a very long time, China, I often said, rode two horses. Um, they were developing their own systems and approaches, but they were still very keen to engage in the multilateral system. I used to be at the IMF and sat through endless meetings where we argued about how big a voice, how big a share China should have in the Bretton Woods institutions in the IMF and the World Bank. And I think the world was too slow in accommodating China and giving it a voice that was proportionate to the size of its economy. And because we were too slow, China then proceeded to set up its own institutions. And we've seen that now. And so institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Bank, the Belt and Road Initiative, the huge increase in swap lines that the central bank in China has now with over 30 countries as they try and create an RMB-based trading system. All of those are symptoms of the fact that China felt like it wouldn't get a fair deal in the existing international system, so they were going to create a parallel one. And I think the recent hardening of positions in Washington has meant that we risk that them, rather than riding two horses, they may switch to their own horse. Um, and I think, I would like to think that we could avoid that. I would like to think that you know, cooler heads will prevail in terms of the wider interests. Organizations like SWIFT are hugely dependent on interconnections and free flow of information, finance, trade. But if we fail, we will have to think a lot about how to build pipes between two parallel economic systems and spheres of influence, which will be much less efficient. The case of Huawei, in a way, showed us the risks of, of decoupling. But what I'm trying to get to is what needs to be done on both sides to get to some kind of understanding. Mm. 
I don't think we will be able to get multiple deals, uh, but perhaps some kind of an understanding. Yes. I mean, I think um, there are a set of issues around intellectual property, which there has actually been some progress m made in the trade negotiations on intellectual property. I think it's eased by the fact that China has become a producer of intellectual property itself and has technological innovations, huge increase in, t in patents by Chinese companies, universities, and the government. And so I actually am fairly optimistic on the intellectual property side that there will be an emerging understanding. And I think that the trickier issues are around the structure of China, China's economy and the role of state-owned enterprises and the pace at which China liberalizes those aspects of the economy, because that goes to the heart of the economic system and particularly to employment and whether those workers will be protected or not. And I think that's the much trickier part of finding an understanding. Moving on to monetary policy. Uh, Mario Draghi, last week, according to some, did more than it takes, not whatever it takes, and there was quite a bit of a backlash, particularly in Germany. Yeah. Do you think he made the right decision? Well, I think the ECB is facing a situation where they've been below their inflation target now for years. Uh, so I think, you know, they, he, he acted within his mandate, which was to try and deliver a, an inflation target, which was near 2%. Um, I do think that he, you know, he did what he had to do, but I do think that he also has been calling for a shift in the balance of policy toward fiscal policy. I think Christine Lagarde, when in her testimony to the European Parliament said, I'm not a fairy. I can't sprinkle some magic and create growth. And monetary policy, as we know, simply creates demand. It does not solve the supply side and the growth side of the economy. And really, there is a need for more fiscal activism in Europe, but also in other countries. How much room is there for fiscal activism in Europe? Yeah. I mean, it is true that debt levels are high post the financial crisis. Most countries in Europe have debt levels which are in the order of, you know, somewhere between 60 to 100 percent of GDP, with Italy being the major outlier in terms of its uh, its debt levels. There has been a sort of um, new fashion called uh, the new monetary uh, the new monetary theory, which argues that as long as your growth rate is higher than your interest rate, you can keep borrowing. And that is true, from you know. Numerically, that is true, as long as your growth rate is higher than your interest rate. Uh, and that argument has been used to, to make the case for why even highly indebted countries in Europe can afford to borrow more. But of course, you have to be prudent, because at some point, the interest rate may be higher than your growth rate, in which case, your debt becomes unsustainable. Um, so I think there is room to borrow. I think it's vital that the borrowing that's done creates new productive capacity, is in, investing in things like infrastructure and skills so that the productivity and investment opportunities in those economies increases over time. And if there's more borrowing for that purpose, I think markets would see that as credible. Do you think that the world of low interest rate is now the new normal? I think it's going to be the new normal for quite a while. Um, you know, the reason interest rates are very low is, is simply because savings exceed the amount of investment opportunities there are out there. And savings are very high because populations are aging, and that is a long-term demographic trend. What, one can, what can change is the investment opportunities out there, and governments have the tools to alter that, as do the fact that new emerging markets are becoming increasingly attractive with higher investment returns. And so I think the only prospect for interest rates going up are in terms of changing the dynamics of investment opportunities in the global economy. And I think we're, we're going to be discussing some ways of, of changing these dynamics. But looking at the Fed, um, Jay Powell also came under some criticism, although he did not move as, as, as far as the, the ECB. 
Um, and he is, of course, under pressure from, uh, from the president. How worried should we be about the independence of central banks? Because this isn't just in the US, we've seen also pressure in India, we've seen pressure, long-lasting pressure in Turkey. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think it's a very tough time to be a central banker. Um, I think the reasons differ uh, in the advanced economies, it's a tough time to be a central banker because, partly because in the wake of the crisis, central banks took extraordinary measures, which I think were required in order to avoid a Great Depression in the wake of the financial crisis. But as a result of that, the quantitative easing grew their balance sheets enormously, increased asset prices, and just made central bank policy much more visible and more politically contentious. And so I think in the advanced economies, that is the challenge, and that's why independence is being challenged. In the emerging markets like Turkey, like India, it's essentially a fiscal problem. Governments want to spend more, and they want lower interest rates, and they want central banks to deliver lower interest rates so they can spend more. Um, and that's a much more old-fashioned problem, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but very real at the moment. So you said um, that it's it's a tough time to be a central banker, and yet, at least according to the FT, uh, you may be a central banker again. So are you, I just think it's important for this audience to hear it from you. Uh, you are in the running for the Bank of England. I have a very nice job at the moment, which I'm enjoying immensely. <laughs> That's a very polite answer. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of um, the Bank of England, because I would like to uh, pivot to Brexit as well. I mean, that we cannot have a conversation in London without talking about Brexit, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, the Bank of England held fire um, last week, and it has been adopting more of a wait-and-see approach. You think that's the right approach, given the uncertainty? I mean... Inflation is not that far from where it is supposed to be. Uh, I think there is huge uncertainty as to the nature of the relationship with Europe uh, and what potential trade deal will be had. I think it was. I think it's prudent to wait and see. I'm not going to ask you to predict what's going to happen with Brexit, uh, <laughs> because at least to me it feels like Groundhog Day uh, every day. But. I do think that we have to start thinking about the structure of the British economy post-Brexit, whether it's a soft Brexit, whether it's a no-deal Brexit, things will have to change. Yeah. Do you think that it's inevitable that um, the UK will become a more low-tax, low-regulation state? I don't think it's inevitable. I think it's a policy choice, and I think it will depend hugely on what kind of government we have at the time. You know, the UK economy is 80% services. I think that's likely to remain the case. I think there were some people who thought with sterling uh, at a much lower value that we would have a resurgence of manufacturing in the UK. That has never happened historically. It has not happened yet. I think the nature of manufacturing is also changing in the world because of automation and that global supply chains are shifting because of that. Uh, you may see some reshoring of manufacturing. You know, I recently visited a, a, a chemical plant, a huge chemical plant that was being run by one guy with six computer screens because it was really more or less fully automated. Uh, and so suddenly low wages are no longer the key determinant for firms location decisions. So that may change a little bit at the margin, but I think in the end, the UK is going to be a knowledge-based economy based primarily in services, and those services will probably widen as a result uh, of some of these economic changes. I think Brexit per se may affect the destination, depending on the nature of the relationship with Europe, the destination of those service exports. Uh, and if there's a less favorable trade deal with Europe, some of those exports may shift to other markets. Uh, but I think the structure of the economy uh, will not change fundamentally from what it is today. Does that mean that there are opportunities as well as major risks in, in Brexit? Where specifically might we see the opportunities? 
Well, I think a, it is so hard to say without knowing what the trade relationship will be with Europe and with the rest of the world. Um, what we do know is that trade deals take a great deal of time. Uh, and I suspect that until that time passes, many firms may become more domestically focused until those trade deals are, are, uh, are agreed. Um, that that's, may not a, that's an interesting point, that a lot of firms may have to focus on the domestic market more. That would be my, you know, given the long lags in, or in, in negotiating trade deals, if you didn't have good trading relationships, a, a, a trade deal, a good trade deal with the, with the EU, and by the time you get others in place, I think that will, that is a possible consequence. When it comes to universities, this has been a, a great success story, export success story for, yes. for the UK. Yes. Um, it is entirely possible that we will get far fewer European students. Uh, there's a lot of EU research money that comes into the UK. What, what worries you the most? And how is the LSE, for example, preparing? And how, what lessons can, can we draw? Yeah. So I think if you look at the UK university sector as a whole, there has been a decline in applicants from Europe, students. We have not seen that at the LSE. We've actually seen an increase from, in applicants from Europe. I think we're a little bit distinct because we have a global brand and we're a little bit sheltered from some of this, but in the, on the whole, you have seen a decline in, in student numbers. I think the recent announcement on post-study work visas, which will allow graduates from UK universities to work in the UK for two years to get experience, will actually help quite a lot in terms of attracting more international students. But the thing I'm most worried about is what you, what you indicated, which is the collaborative research that we do with Europe. So if you look at what the most widely cited research is in the world, it tends to be research that is a product of international collaborations. Uh, and the best quality research comes from that. And it is vital for UK universities to stay connected to the European Research Network and creating a UK alternative is not enough. I heard a wonderful example from the head of the Swiss universities. The Swiss universities uh, fell out of the European research system for two years, ironically because of a referendum. Uh, and the Swiss government created its own pot of money to try and replicate the European pot of money to fund research at Swiss universities. And the head of the Swiss University Federation said to me, you know, it was a bit like telling Roger Federer that you can't play in Wimbledon anymore, but we're gonna create our own little international tennis tournament in Lausanne, and the prize money will be the same, and you can just play there. Of course that's not the same. If you're gonna be globally competitive, you want to compete on a global stage. Uh, so I think that is the most important thing, that UK universities have to remain connected to and a part of the European research network in order to stay uh, globally competitive. You wrote in, in the FT earlier this year um, that populists have a point. That was the headline of, of your piece. Um, and I quote what you said, to ward off the populist threat, we cannot pretend that the old system was fine. We must address the legit legitimate grievances populists identified. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Because br Brexit is part of the same trend. Absolutely. So if you look at what's happened to income distribution around the world over the last 20 years, there's a very clear pattern. The people whose incomes have grown the most are two groups, the top 1% and the middle class in the emerging markets. The group who's experienced the worst income growth is the middle class in the advanced economies. And so it's not a surprise that those groups have been very disgruntled. And there are many dimensions to responding to that disgruntlement. People talk about groups who've been left behind. I think some of them would say, well, they were never given a chance. They live in part, there's a very strong geographical element. There's a, there's a sense that there are many, 
There are many parts of the country in the UK, but also in other countries where populism is rising, where there's been very little investment in infrastructure, in, in jobs, and the opportunities that those people have had have been very, very few. Education is a key part of the story. Um, you know, there's a very close correlation between low levels of education and people who vote for populist parties, not because they're not intelligent, but because they know that the current set of policies are strongly in favor of those who have education. And if you haven't got an education, your economic prospects are poor. And so responding with education is a key part of, uh, of that story. Education, infrastructure to parts of the country that haven't ha been given an opportunity. But that also brings me to the whole issue of capitalism and the reform of capitalism. Uh, we've just launched at the FT a, a new brand campaign, so this is very much on our mind and we have a, a series um, coming out uh, about this. But the business roundtable in, in the US, which is made up 200 uh, CEOs, recently issued a statement uh, about stakeholder capitalism, saying essentially that share, shareholder maximizing profits cannot be the only and the primary purpose of a corporation. Do you think that in this response to, capital, to uh, populism, mm. there has to be a reset, a reform? I do think there has to be a reset. Um, and I think this is a welcome debate, that corporations are thinking about wider stakeholders, employees, communities they work, they operate in. But I also think that voluntary approaches by corporations are not enough. I think it's great that there are enlightened leaders of corporations who are showing the way, and I welcome that and applaud that. But I think in the end, if you want to have a consistent approach across an economy, you will need changes in the rules and changes in the laws. Uh, because it's very easy when being socially and environmentally responsible moves you in the same direction as uh, shareholder value. So for example, you'll hear lots of very you know, forward-thinking corporate leaders saying, I'm gonna have really good environmental and social policies because it helps me recruit millennials. And I get much better talent if they know they're working in an, in an organization that has social purpose. Well, that's pretty consistent with shareholder value because it's linked to the, my talent strategy. So that's, that's relatively easy. I think the tricky part comes when say I have to change my energy mix more quickly than might be financially optimal for environmental reasons. Or I have to invest more in retraining workers when I am restructuring my company rather than simply laying them off, which might be much, much cheaper. I think in order to make that happen, there will have to be changes in the rules of the game. Uh, so I welcome the, the debate. The question is how far it goes before you stifle capitalism because, I mean, you, you, you do need to strike a very delicate balance you there. You do, you do. And of course, there is another way of doing it, which is to say, okay, fine, you do shareholder value, but I'm going to tax you a lot more in order to pay for the retraining. And I think that that may actually make sense in many countries. If you Sorry about that. If you think about what's happened to labor markets, most workers today are much less attached to their employers. If you go on LinkedIn, the average number of jobs on a CV has gone up every year. And so it's legitimate to ask, does it make sense for employers to invest in workers who are going to turn over very quickly? Maybe there is another solution, which might be an industry-wide solution, or maybe a public sector solution and that firms would pay in, and the government would then invest in retraining those workers to make sure that they have a future. So, so I think these are exactly the kind of questions we need to be asking as to how far you can push the, the stakeholder approach. You mentioned um, retraining. Are you a pessimist or an optimist when it comes to uh, AI and jobs? Yeah. So I definitely think artificial intelligence and automation will change most jobs. At least half of jobs will be changed in a fundamental way over the next 10 or 20 years because of AI. 
but I'm a optimist because I don't think jobs are going to disappear. I don't buy this, suddenly we're all going to be unemployed and we all need to have a universal basic income to survive because we won't have any jobs to do. I don't buy that. Jobs will change. I think what's different about the AI revolution is that we're used to thinking about manufacturing jobs changing, that workers are replaced by machines. The AI, re AI revolution will change jobs that we don't normally think of being prone to automation. Accountants, lawyers, doctors, those kind of professional jobs, which increasingly parts of will be automated. So for example, diagnostic tools. There are now incredible diagnostic tools which can diagnose, say, eye diseases better than any doctor can. So increasingly, our diagnostic treatment will be done by a machine, but you'll still want to talk to a doctor about your treatment plan, and the doctor will have to develop a different set of skills which complement what the machine does. And so I think we need to think about what roles will complement what can be automated uh, and, and develop those skills in the next generation. And we need to invest much, much more than we're investing. I'm, this is a bit of a hobby horse for me, but if you look at countries that have been successful in looking after employees during this digital revolution, there are countries like Denmark who spend 1.7% of GDP, which is a very big number, on what they call active labor market policies, preparing the workforce for the jobs of the future. Countries like the UK, countries like the US spend less than a fraction of one to two percent of that, of, of what the Danes spend. And so I think that's also a key part of the solution. So with a call to investment, we have to wrap uh, this up. Thank you so much, Minouche, for Th being with us. Thank you, Lola. Thank you all very much. <laughs>